Good evening, everybody. I'm David Asman, in for Lou Dobbs, who is on vacation. Well, White House Chief of Staff John Kelly today taking on the national left-wing media to blast reports of tension with the president. Kelly saying it's shocking for both him and the president when they read outright lies. One of his frustrations is you, uh, all of you. I'm a reasonable guy, but when I read in the morning, I read the, uh, well, I won't tell you what I read, but and watch TV in the morning, it's just, it is astounding to me how much is misreported. We're going to take up the media's endless assault against this president. Also tonight, President Trump taking action where Congress has failed. The president signing a new executive order to start dismantling the disastrous Obamacare. We'll have a full report. And California in crisis. The fires that have devastated Northern California's wine country are still raging with relief nowhere in sight. So far, at least 29 people have been killed. Hundreds more remain missing. We'll have the very latest. But our top story tonight, John Kelly setting the record straight. The president's chief of staff making a surprise appearance at the White House press briefing to make it clear the administration will not put up with the left-wing media's endless stream of fake news. Fox News's chief White House correspondent, John Roberts, has our report. Well, David, good evening to you. The chief of staff, John Kelly, is the latest subject of palace intrigue stories, with some reports suggesting that he won't remain in the job for very long. Well, like the Secretary of State Rex Tillerson did last week, Kelly himself came out today to say, you got it wrong. It was a surprise move in the daily briefing. White House Chief of Staff John Kelly meeting the White House press corps on the record for the first time to say reports of his demise are greatly exaggerated. I'm not quitting today. Uh, I, I don't believe, and I just talked to the president, I don't think I'm being fired today. Um, and uh, I am not so frustrated in this job that uh, I'm thinking of leaving. Kelly, long known in military circles as a no BS straight shooter, acknowledged that chief of staff is the hardest job he has ever had, but disputed the notion that certain aspects of it are getting to him. Are you frustrated? No, I'm not frustrated. This is really, really hard work, uh, running the United States of America. I don't run it, uh, but I'm working for someone who is uh, dedicated to serving the country. I don't mean any criticism to Mr. Trump's predecessors. But there was an awful lot of things that were, in my view, kicked down the road um, that came, have come home to roost pretty much right now that have to be dealt with. Kelly did admit to being frustrated by news reports he said had little or no basis in reality and had some advice for certain members of the media. You know, maybe develop some better sources. The White House went out of its way today to indicate Kelly is safe in his job. At an event to officially nominate Kelly's Deputy Chief of Staff Kirsten Nielsen as the new DHS Secretary, President Trump gave Kelly a shout out and singled him out for high praise. We are deeply fortunate that he is now here at the White House as our Chief of Staff. Do you agree with that, Kirsten? Nielsen, who was also Kelly's Chief of Staff at DHS, would become the sixth secretary and also the first former staffer to lead the department. I share the president's profound commitment to the security of our country. If confirmed, Nielsen will inherit the federal response to Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. President Trump drew fire for a tweet about Puerto Rico this morning when he wrote, quote, We cannot keep FEMA, the military, and the first responders who have been amazing under the most difficult circumstances in Puerto Rico forever. Democrats portrayed the tweet as heartless. It's heartbreaking and it's, it lacks knowledge knowledge about what the role is of FEMA and the others in time of natu nat natural disaster. But the chief of staff was quick to cover his boss's six. I think he said the U.S. military and FEMA can't be there forever. There will be a period in which uh, we hope sooner rather than later to where the U.S. military and FEMA uh, generally speaking, can withdraw. President Trump also drew fire today for his plans to expand access to health care for small businesses and individuals. We are moving toward lower costs and more options in the health care market and taking crucial steps toward saving the American people from the nightmare of Obamacare. In an executive order directing his lieutenants at Treasury, Labor and HHS to allow small employers to band together and buy health insurance across state lines. 
The plan would also give more people access to short-term limited duration insurance and allow employers more flexibility with health reimbursement arrangements to pay for employees' medical needs. Democrats pointed out short-term plans are exempt from Obamacare coverage protections. In a statement, Senator Chuck Schumer saying, quote, this order couldn't be further from the great health care the president promised. It will send costs soaring for older Americans and those with pre-existing conditions and add further chaos to the markets. While it has been a busy news week so far, the biggest news will come in the lunch hour tomorrow. That's when President Trump will give a speech to outline his new Iran policy. As we have been reporting this week, the president is expected to not recertify the Iran deal and ask Congress for a tough new series of measures to rein in Iran's behavior. David? John Roberts from the White House. John, thank you. More than 8,000 firefighters in Northern California tonight struggling to stop the spread of all those wildfires. The devastating blazes have already claimed the lives of at least 29 people, with communication problems plaguing the search for hundreds of missing people. Fox News senior correspondent Adam Housley is in Napa County with our very latest report. From the sky and the ground, views of utter destruction on day four of the fires in California's wine country. Never, never in my life. I mean, there's been fires that just blow through. We're just on edge right now. It's just, it's awful, absolutely awful. While they're making slow progress, fire officials warn it's far from over. We are in this fight for the long haul. Uh, it's going to continue to get worse before it gets better. As resources pour in from around the state and country, crews are prepping for the next round of the firefight. The National Weather Service warns that humidity is still low and the winds will pick up again over the weekend. News that worries those living in evacuation centers like Karen Ingalls. I'm praying a lot, <laughs> a lot, and asking for prayers from, you know, my family and friends. So, um so that we still have something to go back to. This is the garage door. And thousands don't. California state lawmakers toured the devastation on Wednesday and promised to help those who lost everything. It's heartbreaking and uh, we need to provide as much as relief as possible to the, the victims' families. You know, we have a lot of folks, hundreds of folks who are still unaccounted for. Hundreds of people are still listed as missing, but law enforcement says that number could be inflated due to duplicates and communication issues. Cell surface still having problems. People have been evacuated from multiple areas. They're just not connecting with their families. I've just been pulling my hair just trying to find her. The missing includes Jeff Baumach's mother, 61-year-old Norma Zar. She has a lot of medical conditions, and that's what really worries us. We've checked all the hospitals, and we still can't find her. For those who aren't found alive, law enforcement has begun the painstaking task of identifying remains. Identification is going to be hard. So far in the recoveries, we have found bodies that were almost completely intact, and we have found bodies that were nothing more than ash and bones. This is the front line of the Atlas fire in southern Napa County. You can see the fire crews putting out the hot spots. They did a pretty good job of stopping it here. We know there are forensic teams on several different sites of fires looking for any possible remains. And also at this hour, still no official cause for any of these fires. David? Adam Housley, thank you very much. The House today approving a $36.5 billion disaster aid package, including relief for those affected by the wildfires and, of course, the hurricanes. Lawmakers now turning their focus to tax reform with Republican leaders warning members that they could stay in session through the holidays if they don't act on tax cuts for the middle class. Fox News chief congressional correspondent Mike Emanuel has our report. Half this country is living paycheck to paycheck. And if that means we've got to stay here till Christmas to give them the relief they need and deserve, then tough, we will do that. Speaker Paul Ryan says Congress must fix the tax code by the end of the year. House Democratic Leader Nancy Pelosi fired back about keeping the House in on a Friday instead. The speaker said this morning he'll keep us in until Christmas to do his tax cuts for the rich. Why don't we just stay in tomorrow and get moving on some of this so we can have a bipartisan discussion? Last night, President Trump sold his tax reform plan outside Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, talking about its potential impact on the middle class. My Council of Economic Advisors estimates that this change, along with a lower tax rate, would likely give the typical American household 
a $4,000 pay raise. The president emphasized he wants a major tax deal with Fox's Sean Hannity. You can get as much as a 40% tax reduction. Again, it's the largest tax reduction in the history of Let's go through. One issue that could shrink the tax package is the controversy over eliminating the state and local tax deduction. It allows people in high tax states like New York, New Jersey, and California to save on their federal tax bills. Some lawmakers are concerned about the impact slashing the state and local write-off would have on the middle class, and Democrats have pounced. The numbers are really powerful here today, and you might want to think of it this way. 44 million households that represent more than 100 million Americans derive this middle class benefit. Ways and Means Chairman Republican Kevin Brady and GOP leaders are looking at ways people in high tax states can get relief as well. That's the fun part of my job. We've been doing this for a while now. I, I, I actually room with Kevin Brady, the chairman of the Ways and Means Committee. So we, we've talked about the, the details. This morning, Ryan tried to rally conservatives for the fight, warning lobbyists and Democrats may try to derail this effort. When that army comes, we must be able to count on the foot soldiers of the conservative movement to see this thing through. The House has passed its budget with tax reform language in it. The Senate's expected to take it up first thing next week. So there is more time for some tax reform fine-tuning. David? Mike Emanuel, thank you very much. We are coming back with much more. Please stay with us. White House Chief of Staff John Kelly vowing to help hurricane-ravaged Puerto Rico until the island is sufficiently recovered. Our country will stand with those American citizens in Puerto Rico until the job is done. We'll discuss Congress's progress on disaster aid, tax cuts, and more with Congressman Ron DeSantis. And President Trump has brought the NFL to its knees. The NFL and the Players Association set to meet next week to discuss the player insult of our flag, our anthem, and our values. We'll take up the culture warrior president and a lot more. Stay with us. It's now investigating shocking reports of corruption in hurricane-stricken Puerto Rico. Federal agents tell Fox News they are receiving calls from local residents saying local officials are withholding critical supplies. Now, FBI Special Agent Carlos Osorio highlighting one allegation where an official is accused of pulling his own car around the back of a government building and driving off after loading it full of FEMA supplies. At least 45 deaths have now been blamed on Hurricane Maria. 90% of the island is still without power, and the government says it hopes to have electricity restored completely by March. That is still five months away. Joining me now is Congressman Ron DeSantis of Florida, a key member of several committees, including foreign affairs, judiciary, and oversight. He's also a member of the Freedom Caucus. Congressman, good to see you. Uh, nobody would begrudge the people of Puerto Rico after everything they've been through of anything they, they need. But if officials are getting rich with aid that's supposed to go to, to people who are starving, who are hungry, who deserve relief, uh, that's a crime. That needs to be stopped. How do we monitor that? Well, you're right. It not only is uh, wasting tax dollars, it's stealing from the hurricane victims in Puerto Rico. We saw this uh, corruption after Katrina in, in places in New Orleans with a corrupt mayor. Unfortunately, in Puerto Rico, you've had a lot of corruption in the government uh, for a long time. So I think that the administration should absolutely be very forward-leaning in policing that. Uh, if you can hold somebody accountable very publicly and very directly, I think that may deter others from taking a similar course. And it's just a tragic situation that some of those supplies aren't going to people who've really had their whole lives turned upside down. But there's just people who just don't get it in our society, unfortunately. Yeah. Well, and let's be specific about how it all happened. I mean, the, the, the bloated bureaucracy uh, that existed in Puerto Rico for, for decades, literally, was a, a result of the welfare state. They had all the benefits of, of a welfare society uh, without all of the responsibilities that are entailed in providing those services to the public. And the governor's trying to change things. Governor Rocio is trying to change things, but he's only been in there for, I guess, a little less than a year and it takes a long time. In the meantime, billions of dollars of aid are going in to a corrupt system. It's, it's a tough thing to handle. Well, you also had, um, in 20, 2008 to 2012, Luis Fortuño, Republican governor, was very reform-minded. He was instituting reforms 
Then he lost a narrow election in 2012. Um, and so we had four years where there really wasn't much done to deal with any of the problems at the government. Now I think this governor is trying to do that. But you're right. There's been so many problems that have built up year after year uh, that it's a tough situation. Yeah. But p put aside the hurricane, uh, which is obviously very difficult circumstances, the, the fiscal situation there uh, was really disastrous. And so this is really, I think, a time for the leaders in Puerto Rico to say, you know what, we've got to do this a better right. way. I think the governor's trying to do that. I want to talk about the fiscal situation regarding the whole country and our taxes. Uh, the, the president, of course, he's going to have trouble with the Democrats. Uh, they're labeling his tax reform plan just, just for the wealthy, which, of course, is ridiculous. But even a lot of Republicans, under the guise of deficit reduction, uh, are suggesting that, that you know, they, they couldn't possibly accept it under certain circumstances. Here is Senator Corker talking about this on National Public Radio a couple of days ago. Take a listen. Unless it reduces deficits, let me say that one more time, unless it reduces deficits and does not add to deficits with reasonable and responsible growth models, and unless we can make it permanent, um, I don't have any interest in it. I don't have any, I don't have any, I mean, the American people have a lot of interest in it. They have a big stake in it. Uh, the arrogance of saying, I don't have any interest in it unless it's everything I want, I mean, that's not the way you get stuff done, is it? That is the swamp speaking. That is what the voters are so frustrated about to try to put up any roadblock you can to prevent this president from succeeding. That is not what our voters sent us here to do. Our voters sent us here to get things done and to help the president pass this key tax reform. Here's the thing, though, David. These guys don't complain. The establishment Republicans, they don't complain about deficits when they're spending like drunken sailors. They've been there, Why yeah, not? they've been there for years, and the deficit exactly. has, has gone up, up, up. Why not do a really bold tax cut, a really bold yeah. tax reform, and then pair that with reductions and limits on domestic spending. There's no reason a Republican Congress couldn't do that, but it's telling yeah. the people who are opposing tax reform because of deficits, they're not willing to deal with our spending Well, I'll problem. give you a reason why they don't want to do it, and that's partly because of the swamp itself. I'm, I'm told that lobbyists are just going nuts inside the Beltway, that they're knocking on every door in Congress. Uh, we had uh, Congressman Meadows in from, from your Freedom Caucus saying that just yesterday morning, he had four groups of lobbyists in to, to talk about how they wanted to save their particular deductions. Are you getting the same knocks in your door? Uh, there, the uh, estimate is there's going to be a billion dollars spent in lobbying on this wow. tax bill because we have a 70,000 page tax code. It didn't get that way by accident. There are a lot of perks. There are a lot of special interest giveaways in there. Uh, but here's the thing. We have a chance to really do something that will lay a good foundation for economic growth for our country into the future. Yes, the market's done good. Yes, there's sentiment, optimism because of this president. But if we don't provide this foundation, you know, we're not going to be able to grow three, three and a half percent consistently. So yes, that's happening. That's the, how the swamp works. This is a chance for Republicans to rise above that and do what's best for taxpayers rather than do what's best for Washington's interests. Congressman, best of luck in draining that swamp. <laughs> We're really rooting for you. Ron DeSantis, thank you very much for joining us. Appreciate thank it. Thank you. Yep. And be sure to vote in tonight's poll. Is it time for the NFL to hand out harsh penalties for players who continue to insult the anthem and our flag? Cast your vote on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. And a reminder to follow Lou on Twitter at Lou Dobbs. Like the show on Facebook and Instagram at Lou Dobbs tonight. On Wall Street, stocks falling from record levels. The Dow dropping 32 points. The S&P off four. The Nasdaq down 12. Volume on the big board, 3.1 billion shares. AT&T plunging over 6% after that company lost 90,000 paid TV subscribers in the third quarter. And J.P. Morgan and Citigroup reporting better than expected uh, earnings, but shares closing lower as both banks set aside more money for credit card lending losses. A reminder to listen to lose reports three times a day, coast to coast on the Salem Radio Network. Up next, President Trump is standing up for American values. I will tell you, you cannot disrespect our country, our flag, our anthem. You cannot do that. We are going to take up the NFL anthem controversy with Ed Rollins coming next.
I'm David Asman in for Lou Dobbs, who is on vacation. Representatives of the NFL Players Union will join next week's owners meeting to discuss the anthem controversy. Commissioner Roger Goodell put out a memo Tuesday saying everybody should stand for the national anthem. He says the league will present a plan to move past this debate. Joining me now to talk about this and a lot of other stuff, Ed Rollins, who's chairman of the Great America PAC, esteemed member of the political consultant, Hall of Fame, and a Fox News contributor. Ed, uh, I want to try to put together a couple of things. Sure. don't necessarily relate directly, but the NFL, Harvey Weinstein, what's happening with NBC News and the kerfuffle there where they, right. they killed the story on Harvey Weinstein, some people say because of the connections between NBC News president and Harvey Weinstein. Uh, it, it's all a part of a piece of the culture wars and how President Trump has gone after the PC culture in this country uh, head on. And he got a, as, as soon as he does, he gets a lot of criticism. But he always turns out, it seems to me, to be on the winning side of he, this he, he has an instinct, uh, an instinct like the NFL. I mean, there's a lot of people who are appalled by the behavior. A lot of these pro athletes who are extraordinary talent and, and, and the game they play, uh, but people think they're rather privileged too by their salaries and what have you. But no one ever says no to them. Uh, a Harvey Weinstein, no one says no to a guy like that. Lots of people knew about his behavior uh, as it's coming out, uh, and they should have said no. You don't do this. This is not the way you treat women. This is not the way you treat uh, people that are that, that work for you. And These they all kind of work together. The elite kind of cover for each Absolutely. other. They're buddy buddy with each other. Uh, they, they, in the case of Hillary Clinton, they, they literally uh, lie about some of the accusers and, and then have the nerve to come out now and say that these accusers of Harvey Weinstein are very brave women when those are exactly the same kind of women or were treated the same way as Bill, by Bill Clinton it's in when the, she was trying to in, stop in, them. In, in the case of this harassment, it's, it's, all, it's all about power, misuse of power, and I think to a certain extent. Uh, the, the, the NFL players, obviously, uh, they have to live by... Lots of rules as they play the game. Uh, they have to play by rules on the, on, the, on the field. They can't go around beating up their girlfriends anymore, uh, uh, as, as they shouldn't. And I think to a certain extent, the society is taking a, a real look, a very libertarian society, sort of do what you want to do but don't hurt others, is kind of the rule of a lot of these young people. And I think to a certain extent, uh, the hypocrisy is what's dooming a lot of this. But the president himself, he's, he's been very busy, obviously, uh, with deregulation policy, uh, dealing with events overseas. Uh, now he's trying to get Congress to do something on taxes. I hope he succeeds. Lord knows if he'll be able to. But he, he views his role as a culture warrior very as, as a very important part of his presidency as well. I and, think and he takes he takes that on directly. And very often at first he, they say, oh, you're crazy. This is, this is a, a ridiculous tweet. He ends up on the winning side. Well, he does because I think he has, again, I think he taps in. It's not about polls. It's not about him basically political advisors because he doesn't have any. I think just instinctively he sees things that he thinks relates to ordinary people. Uh, what's made him a success in his, in his, in his television business. It's made him a successful candidate, an unconventional candidate, but a successful candidate. And I think it may very well make him a successful president by tapping into these things that people are very concerned and about. And eventually they turn around. I mean, you look at Roger Goodell at first uh, was completely behind the players who were taking a knee. Now he says he wishes they would all stand up during the end. Well, he just has to tell them to all stand up. And the rea reality is all it. They don't have to do anything else. You just have to stand up, hold their helmet, and be quiet for four minutes. That's not asking too much. Will the, the defeat, and I think it's going to continue because it's been happening every month since he's been president, will the defeat of this PC culture that he's after Will it lead to political victories? Will it lead to more political power inside the Beltway so that he can get tax cuts and other stuff? Well, the power, the power inside the Beltway comes from people outside the Beltway. And what he's done since his campaign is he's tapped in to those, you know, it's, it's sort of like when we grew up, the silent majority uh, in, in America that was very significant in the, in the 60s and the 70s. And I think there's a silent majority out there again. We're sort of appalled by all of this. They basically think these are very privileged people who basically violate other people's rights. And I think to a certain extent, ta he's tapped into that. But it's interesting you say something. Rush Limbaugh says it as well. He says he doesn't think that the media is parroting what the Democrats are saying. He thinks that the Democrats inside the Beltway are parroting and being told what to say by the people outside the Beltway, the people in New York and Los Angeles. Well, I think the reality is we're, we're a very divided up country. Uh, uh, rural America, suburban America is different than big urban cities. Uh, the, the red and blue is very real, and I think to a certain extent it's a value system as much as anything else. Ed Rollins, my great pleasure. to see you, my friend. Thank, Thank you. you very much. We are coming right back with much more. Please stay with us.
President Trump is expected to decertify the disastrous Iran nuclear deal tomorrow. I know exactly what I'm going to do, but I can't give it away. There's no secret. I think it was one of the most incompetently drawn deals I've ever seen. We'll discuss the fallout of that decision with Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer. And this group of skydivers are about to put on a show like you have never seen before. We'll show you their flawless and jaw-dropping performance right here next. Stay with us. President Trump is expected to announce his decision to not recertify the Iran deal tomorrow. The president has long been a critic of the agreement, and he repeated his displeasure with the deal on Hannity last night. Take a listen. It was an incompetently drawn deal. deal. Look, it was, it's yeah. a very bad deal. I, I'm not saying anything different tonight than I have been saying for two years. Yeah. It's a horrible, horrible embarrassment to our country. Let and we did you. it out of weakness when actually we had great strength. Meanwhile, U.S. military data stolen by a hacker named ALF during a months-long breach of an Australian military subcontractor's computer network. The attack, which may have originated in China, targeted data related to sophisticated U.S. and Australian weapons system. This is the third breach of U.S. military information announced in the last week. Joining me now, retired Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, now a senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research. Hey, David. Uh, how are you doing, uh, Colonel? Very we, good, thank we, you. we have more mounting evidence uh, that a lot of the stuff that is subcontracted to private firms, Intel, dealing with Intel matters of, right. of military allies of ours, whether it's Australia or South Korea, uh, has been infiltrated itself. That is, the Pentagon or the other military will buy these systems, the software program, to right. protect their information and just the opposite happens it infects their system with malware that's happening right. here in the pentagon as well is it not oh yeah the first instance of this david actually inter uh, interesting what happened in the late 90s with uh, something called a uh, checkpoint software firewall one which was actually purchased by the u.s air force to protect their their so-called unclassified systems it was I'll, look i'll just be blunt it was designed by the israelis and it had tons of back doors in it so i i would have thought that we would have learned our lesson very early uh, in the in the early years of cyber operations but we clearly haven't so is there no way to contain it colonel oh absolutely but you have to be smarter than the average bear uh... there's reasons some of the operations i ran cyber operations were only run using government uh, personnel. That is to say that you had government employees, either GS or uh, some designation of civilian or military, and you do things to protect uh, what you do. I mean, look, David, the CIA's had the same problem. Uh, during, uh, during the time that uh, we've, with the current CIA director has been there, Mike Pompeo, they've had compromises of their technology because they give it to contractors. Right. Contractors seems to be the weak link here, and it, it clearly what you described regarding the South Korean breach happened because people were relying on people who supposedly had security clearances, probably had some yeah. level of clearance, but they were clearly designated or targeted by the North Koreans or other bad guys to essentially be a, a Trojan horse to get into and these Colonel, larger systems. I can only imagine that the whole situation has gotten a lot worse because of what we went through with the Obama administration, right. where we had all kinds of security secrets handled much too flippantly uh, by our Secretary of State, among others. And, yes. and of course, the, the overall strategy of how to deal with the world epitomized by the Iranian deal. Yeah. Look, I, I talked to some of the senior folks involved in the Hillary Clinton investigation, and yeah, I, I, they told me that the things that they saw that were compromised literally, quote unquote, set their hair on fire. And these are people with high clearances. So clearly that sort of uh, basically beyond malicious incompetence, uh, you're talking about here a planned event that has been very well, care right. care very carefully orchestrated. And let me remind you, David, the Iranians do this. The North Koreans have a plenty of time, plenty of capability. To and I'm sure they, they, they share Sony. secrets. I'm sure they right. share oh, tips absolutely. about how to do it better. Right. By the way, I got to say, General Kelly, who gave an unbelievably successful, I think, press conference today, yes. in my opinion. Uh, he Concur. spoke about how they had been, even though he was very kind to the previous administration, he said, look, I'm not blaming anybody, but I got to say, we were left with a hell of a plate to deal with here. And, and part of it, of course, what he was talking about was security. 
Right. And clearly, not only have we seen from uh, the compromises, purposeful compromises to the media by what I believe to be members, former members of Obama, Obama's staff, I, I believe people in the intelligence community have leaked, they've got real material weaknesses within the system. Yeah. Uh, and they've got to look at everything. Uh, I, look, uh, David, I once told a senior, Ob uh, a senior administration official going into the Trump administration, they should treat the entire Obama administration like a crime scene. Mm. And I wasn't joking. I mean, you've got to look everywhere for both uh, malignant, uh, intentional uh, things which have been bat broken and things which are just uh, just not working. It's, so. it's not You can't imagine empowering no. one of our enemies, Iran, a, a country that, that, that prays for our destruction as a nation, Clearly. empowering them with billions of... I mean, it's, it's, it's crazy. Historians billion. will look at this as nuts. Uh, right. Lieutenant Colonel Tony Schaefer, good to see you, sir. Thank Great. you for hey, coming thanks, in. David. Thanks, David. Thanks for having me. Sure, thank Please you. Please roll the video. These skydivers do the impossible, coming together to an X formation only to break apart, with some breaking the chain in order to spin in the middle. Take a look at this. It's just extraordinary. Wow. Ah. Coming up next, shocking new reports that Harvey Weinstein's contract allowed allowed for misconduct. As long as he paid the damage, everything was okay. How is that legal? Greg Jarrett takes that up next. New reports tonight that Harvey Weinstein's contract allowed for sexual harassment. A 2015 employment contract reportedly stated the embattled producer could get sued for sexual harassment as long as he reimbursed the Weinstein company for settlements or judgments. We are joined by Fox News legal analyst uh, Greg Jarrett. This is, this is unbelievable. A contract allowing for sexual misconduct. Have you right. ever seen this before? No, I never have. Uh, and if it's true, if it exists, this is... <laughs> This is powerful proof, almost dead bang liability against the Weinstein Company because this contract suggests that they not only enabled his sexual harassment, but they were complicit in allowing him to cover it up by making payments to victims. Uh, and let me let me just be specific. I'm reading from the contract now. It says if Weinstein quote treated someone improperly in violation of the company's code of conduct, he must reimburse. TWC for settlements or judgments. Additionally, you, Weinstein, will pay the company liquidated damages of two hundred fifty thousand for the first such instance, five hundred for the second, seven fifty for the right. third, and a million for each additional. Yeah, I don't know what idiot lawyer actually <laughs> put this in writing, uh, but you know they should have had it in a safe. But it's out there now. TMZ apparently has it. Um, and look, you if you go against an employer with evidence like this, you can get punitive damages as a victim, not just compensatory damages for all kinds of things, loss of job, uh, mental and emotional distress, the list goes on and Is on. Is it fair to say that this, that because of that liability now, this could drain the company of all of its resources? Except in sexual harassment cases, the statute of limitations is usually one year. That's not very long. So they would have to bootstrap it to other claims of mental and emotional distress that was intentional or negligent by the company. There's a longer statute of limitations for okay. that. I want to get to something else because tomorrow we hear from Samantha Power, President Obama's U.N. Right. ambassador. But it's behind closed doors, I think. Behind closed doors, but let, yeah, I say we're <laughs> going to hear, but the, the Congress will hear from her. But about the unmasking, 260 unmaskings in one year, most of them coming between the election in November and the inauguration in January, so just in two yeah. months. Uh, how could she possibly justify this? Ambassador Bolton, by the way, who had the same position, said he only did one or two unmaskings right. in his entire career there. Well, it's very suspicious because, as Chairman Nunes has said, uh, her position doesn't really have anything to do with national security. The proof will be in the unmasking requests, which should be self-proving themselves. If there is nothing in these conversations in which Trump associates were also collected and surveilled that has anything to do with national security, then it's per se illegal. Uh, it is also a felony to use your public office for a political purpose, right, right. and it's a violation of the Hatch Act, so it could be innumerable crimes. Now, again, it's, it's, there's nothing illegal about unmasking itself, but it, you're not supposed to 
be able to use the entire power of the U.S. government, right. all of our intel agencies, for political purposes, to spy on a political enemy. Yeah, and, and it's, I mean, look, Nixon did. is there any question now that the Obama administration was spying on the, the Trump campaign? Uh, we have wiretaps of Carter Page and right. Paul Manafort, and we have all of this intensive surveillance uh, that included Trump associates from the time the president was elected and the day he was inaugurated. Once again, uh, President Trump comes out and says something in a tweet or whatever form. The media goes crazy. They say he's nuts. This is impossible. Eventually, it ends up to be true. Yeah, it looks like he was absolutely right. So many times that's happened. Greg, good to see you. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Coming up next, President Trump forced to bypass Congress, signing an executive order on health care. This will cost the United States government virtually nothing. And people will have great, great health care. And when I say people, I mean by the millions and millions. We'll take up Mr. Trump's unilateral action with Molly Hemingway and Mark Simone after the break. Stay with us.